that I'm afraid to make reference to your mother, who was a glorious witch in the context of J.K. Rowling's world. I got the prize, because I get to stand up and represent all of you, Jane Clarkson's many, many friends, and I take the responsibility seriously. Jane was one of those incredibly gracious, light-hearted, life-loving souls that had her own particular magnetism to replace the world's gravity. To be Jane's friend was to enter this incredibly rich world of beauty, of wit, and of charm, a world that was absolutely, uniquely Jane's, which visitors either got it or they didn't. <laughs> and those who didn't, in my opinion, are the lesser for it. Poor old muggles, we, we have to sympathize. In my family, we have a motto. It is, why be normal? <laughs> ask yourself. It's a great question to ask yourself. It was given to us a very long time ago by a dear friend who purchased a plaque that contained those words, and she gave it to us exactly at a time when my family felt thrust into a world of an unanticipated space where we had to exchange normalcy for something that just felt anything but. We were strangers in our own strange land, and to others we were a bit bewildering. But to us, it became a land that nonetheless began to reveal riches that are discoverable only by those who are destined to live outside of conviction. Convention. <laughs> Not conviction, <laughs> convention. <laughs> Our loving friend recognized the new creations we had become in a world turned upside down and affirmed us as such through a gift of those words. Why be normal? If normal is conventional, predictable, steady, balanced, consistent, flat, same old, same old, Jane Clarkson was not normal. <laughs> In fact, she was perfectly abnormal. Wonderfully, happily, eccentrically, fascinatingly, upside down, much of the time. When she entered Arbor Acres, she created a bit of a buzz. <laughs> With both residents and staff, puzzled about the nature of the not-so-normal woman that had found her way into our oh-so-conventional world. <laughs> she had her own way of thinking, her own way of observing, and, the, and in the creation of her living environment, her own way of defying all the norms of interior decoration. <laughs> <laughs> the residents scratched their heads when sticks and limbs <laughs> and lichens and leaves began piling up outside Jane's door, artifacts that she collected on her daily nature walks, and that over time grew into this huge thicket in the front of the cave, the entrance to Jane's cave. But we learned Jane saw the natural world differently from most. She saw the universe in the microcosm, beauty in the veins of leaves and lichen formations, wonders visible to her and just as invisible to those who have normal eyes. Jane became a pool player shortly after she moved in, playing with the boys gathered at the table, long skirt flying, arms and legs akimbo, <laughs> contorting herself into all manner of shapes to pull off the shot that most <laughs> ladies of her generation would never have attempted. <laughs> arms and legs akimbo kind of captures my visual image of Jane moving through her day in great strides and sways, 
seeming to move in multiple directions at the same time, <laughs> leaving whirlwinds to mark her passage. She was not a restful woman. <laughs> she was energetic, a high stepper, always playful and up for playing any game, including the game of life, according to her own colorful rule book. Three times I had the opportunity to play with Jane in a grand way, when soon after moving here, she joined the cast of our uh, Meals on Wheels musical theatricals. She was a nun in Cardi Gras, a Meals on Wheelian in Car Wars, and a lady of the court in Carmelot. Jane, I must tell you, was absolutely undirectable. <laughs> she was seldom where she was supposed to be. Always felt the rhythm of the song differently from everyone else in the room. Ever willing to voice an opinion about how a lyric should be sung or a line should be read. In general, she kept me constantly askew at every single rehearsal, at the conclusion of which she would say, I'm sorry, I was bad. <laughs> <laughs> Only to repeat the pattern at the very next rehearsal. Uh, Jane was never bad. She was just Jane. Last fall, we went together in a group to the costume closet at Twin City Stage. It was like chasing a cat through a yarn factory. <laughs> <laughs> it is also my happiest memory of Jane. In Carmelot, Jane was a vision in her medieval gown and veil. She sang stage right, or in her case, sort of stage right-ish, <laughs> beside her friend Helen Christie, right over there, who only joined our cast after she became a resident because Jane encouraged her to do so, which illustrates another aspect of Jane's loveliness, her heightened sensitivity to others, and particularly to those who, like herself, found themselves living on the edge of the conventional world's acceptance. Jane was kind to strangers, most likely because she herself was a bit of one. As an actor in the Meals on Wheels ensemble, Jane was forever a bit out of place, with none of the inhibitions that might have turned disorientation into a moment of self-conscious distress, not Jane. She just played her part without worrying about the conventions that tend to restrict our joy in our playing. For most, oddity is an adaptation. It's a way of standing one's ground, of cloaking oneself against the currents of the world to protect the delicate lichen, lichens that are there to establish the uniqueness of every human being. I don't think Jane was cloaking or behaving self-protectively. Jane loved the delicacy of lichens, the irregular veins of leaves that in their chaos also reveal patterns uniquely devised by the divine craftsman. Jane was sweeter than most of us. I never once heard her say an unkind word, even those who, whose, whose, whose feathers she managed to ruffle occasionally in her whirlwind, and who made it their business to say so. Jane had a tender naivete, a childlikeness, as you said. Jane was always I will always think of Jane in the costume closet. A divine child, playing dress-up, oblivious to the rules of order, finding delight in the moment, laughing at herself in the out-of-scale pointy hat, wonderful, happy, and fun. In the context of Arbor Acres, Jane's childlikeness seemed an affront 
to the aging all around her, a defiance even of her own aging. So eternal seemed the child in Jane that when she became fatally ill, we none of us believed it. I still don't believe it. For if ever there were one among us sprinkled with pixie dust, able to escape gravity like Peter Pan and fly, it was Jane. She was the girl who never grew up who lives forever in the normous, in the normless Neverland of God? Why be normal? <laughs> Sorry, there are just too many pigeons to feed, <laughs> dogs to race through the hallways against the rules, costumes to wear, songs to sing, and leaves to collect. Normal? No thanks. I want to be Jane. Aww. I'm gonna fly. Oh, that was beautiful.